stories of murder and dismemberment. Welcome to our new series, focusing in depth on famous crime stories of their day. Each week, we will be focusing on a crime story renowned in its time. Information is derived from historical publications. Today's episode, which took place in 1831 in Brighton, was renowned due to its particularly grisly nature and falls under the category murder and dismemberment. We hope you enjoy the show. John Holloway, born 1806, died 23rd of December 1831, aged 25, was a bigamist, a thief and murderer, and he was found guilty of the willful murder of Celia Holloway, his wife. The story of his crime is as follows. From the Wolverhampton Chronicle and Staffordshire Advertiser, August 1831, horrible murder discovered in the neighbourhood of Brighton. The trunk of a woman was found in a copse near Preston, having the head, arms, thighs and legs severed from it. The body was opened by the surgeon, and the unhappy victim was found to be eight months with child. The mutilated remains have been identified as those of Celia Holloway, the wife of John Holloway, who had not lived with her for several years, but occasionally visited her. Suspicion was attached to him and he was sought after together with Anne Kennett, with whom he had cohabited. An investigation took place before the coroner, and witnesses deposed to the findings of the body with the thighs, but without the head, arms or legs. On the 13th of August, the gruesome discovery of a female torso with blood-stained clothing was found slightly buried. The previous day's heavy rain had washed away the topsoil covering the body and partly revealing the dismembered corpse. The body was quickly identified as being of Celia Holloway, seven to eight months pregnant with child. From Celia being four foot three inches in statue, as well as her advanced state of pregnancy, she was quickly identified by her sister and a woman she had lodged with. About the victim. Celia Holloway, nee Bashford, was born sometime in 1800 in West Sussex. A diminutive woman, she stood at just four feet six inches tall and worked in service as a chambermaid. She has been described in the papers as follows. In stature, she was only four feet three inches being in reality almost a dwarf, so that when either washing or ironing, she was obliged to be placed on a high stool before she could perform her work. Her head was of an extraordinary size in proportion to the rest of her body, and her hands turned outwards like the paws of a mole. It is reported that she met John Holloway at the Brighton racetrack, and fell completely in love with him. Celia was reported to have been about 32 years of age at the time of the brutal killing. Holloway was 25. About the murderer. John Holloway was born in Lewis, not far from where Celia lived. John was little over five feet tall himself. Multiple reports suggest Holloway was something of a playboy and was able to charm several women. He certainly succeeded with Celia, who quickly became pregnant by Holloway. Holloway was known to have held many different jobs, a baker's helper, a bricklayer, a painter, and, notably, a butcher's assistant. In his spare time, Holloway could be found drinking charming women, and betting at the racetrack. Several accounts 
relay John Holloway's public disdain and dislike for Celia, which often resulted in abuse to her, especially when he had been drinking. Yet, the two continued their on-again, off-again relationship long enough for Celia to become pregnant. Setting the scene Upon Celia's pregnancy, Holloway refused to marry her. Celia returned home and applied to the parish overseers for relief for herself and her unborn child. She named John Holloway as the father of that child. The law authorities promptly arrested Holloway for maintenance under a bastard warrant. Holloway stayed in jail for five weeks before relenting and agreeing to marry Celia. In Victorian times, this was a type of legal shotgun wedding. Now that they were married, the authorities ordered the couple to leave the village of Ardingley and they moved to Brighton, hoping to find work, and for some time were housed in the local workhouse. The child was stillborn, but he managed to get Celia pregnant again before going off to sea as an alternative to living with her. That child died aged one. Abroad, he married again, bigamously, using a different name. The woman he married was Anne Kennett, also referred to as Anne Kennard in some publications. Holloway and his new additional wife Anne returned to Brighton to look for work under the name of Mr. and Mrs. Goldsmith. He set up house with Anne, but continued his relationship with Celia. Despite his reported disdain for Celia, Celia became pregnant again. Once again, the authorities immediately placed an order on Holloway of two shillings a week as maintenance to Celia. Holloway, with his meagre, sporadic wages, found it difficult to pay the required maintenance. When he did pay, it was handed to Celia through Holloway's bigamous wife, Anne, as Holloway continued to live with Anne. Holloway's resentment grew with the money he was legally required to pay Celia weekly. A plan was formed. Finding Body Parts David Maskell, a labourer, was walking along a common wood path when he saw some red cotton sticking out of the ground. After some heavy rains of from the previous day, he went back to the spot with a friend, and together they scratched the dirt away. The area smelt strong and bad. Alarmed, a magistrate was sought. Accompanied with a magistrate, and upon clearing away the earth, they discovered the trunk of a human being, having the head, arms, thighs and legs severed from it. Only the things were found with the body. On a surgeon opening the body, a male child, about eight months old, was taken from the womb. The deceased was identified to be Celia Holloway. Attempts to find the head. Since Holloway's committal, the officers have exerted themselves to the utmost to discover the remaining parts of the unfortunate female. At the suggestion of Mr. Falkland, some men were employed to empty the privy connected with four or five houses in Margaret Street, in one of which the prisoner resided. The men had got near the bottom when they found a leg with a stocking on. The next thing they discovered was a piece of bed ticking, which they took up and, horrible to relate, found that it contained the head. The other remains of the poor creature were afterwards taken up. The surgeons examined the head and found that the windpipe was divided in two places, and it was their opinion that the deceased must have had her throat cut. 
In order to prove that the head, legs and arms were connected with the trunk, the surgeons went to Preston and caused the trunk to be disinterred, which, in comparing with the other parts, duly established the fact of it being one frame. The prisoner is about 25 years of age, and the unfortunate victim of his brutality was about 32. The Arrest The discovery of a buried, dismembered body that had been heavy with child became a news sensation. The body, trunk, was quickly identified by Celia's sister, and arrest warrants were issued for John Holloway and Anne Kennett. Anne was collected first in the house that she had shared with Holloway. Holloway, upon hearing the news of Anne's arrest, gave himself in, proclaiming his innocence. Both were sent to Horsham County Jail to await trial. Anne was heavy with child. John Holloway's First Confession any vague doubts of Holloway's guilt were completely dispelled with his confession. Holloway made several different confessions. This is an excerpt of his first confession. From Seven Dials, 1831. John Holloway's first confession. For some time before he committed the murder, he had determined to induce her, Celia, to go out with him to walk in some private place and to assassinate her, but she always refused to accompany him from her lodgings after dark. When all this failed, he took an obscure house in Donkey Row and under pretense of living with her again, prevailed upon her to accompany him to this house. She went with him, and after he had got her inside the house, he seized her by the throat unawares, and she fell to the ground. He drew her under a chest of drawers and continued pressing upon her throat with all his force until he strangled her. When she had ceased struggling, he took out his knife and cut her throat. Finding that he could not carry off the corpse whole, so as to dispose of it in a secret place, he determined to cut it into pieces to enable him to remove a part at different times. He cut off the head and divided the limbs with his knife and cut her in the manner in which the remains of the body were found. He put the trunk and thighs into a box and carried them to the place at Preston, where he dug a hole and buried them. He was the only person in the house when the murder was committed. He alone did it, and he was the guilty person and no one else. After this statement being written down, he took up a pen and signed his name to the paper. He was then removed to his cell and he observed that his mind was relieved of a great burden. John Holloway's Second Confession Holloway writes a second confession in which he clearly implicated his second wife, Anne Kennard, according to Holloway's signed second confession, which he also signed. When at four o'clock in the afternoon on Thursday the 11th of July... Holloway took his wife from her lodgings. They went straight to the house on North Steen Row, which Holloway had hired expressly for the commission of the murder and to which he had just before taken her things. On Holloway opening the street door, his wife Celia first entered and was going up the stairs when, without fastening the door, he approached her as though he was going to kiss her, and suddenly tying a cord around her neck and exerted all his force to strangle her. The poor creature in resisting 
fell to the bottom of the stairs, where she continued to struggle. Holloway, with an end of the cord in each hand, called to Anne for assistance, and God knows she assisted me by taking hold of each end of the rope until the poor girl dropped. I then held the cord myself, and Anne made use of the expression, Do not let your heart fail you. After having committed the murder, the next question was what to be done with the body. Holloway's first idea was to cut it up at once and then remove it piecemeal. He then dragged the body to the closet beneath the stairs where he hung it on a nail for the night. The next night, Holloway borrowed a wheelbarrow from a neighbour, placed the box with Celia's torso and limbs along with a shovel and a pickaxe. Holloway continued, I made an attempt to dig a hole that night, but found it too dark. We just put the box under some bushes near the spot, and also the pickaxe and shovel. We then took the wheelbarrow home. We went down again in the morning as soon as it was light, and I dug a hole with an intent to bury box and all. But I found that it would take up too much of my time because of the roots of the trees. I took the body out and threw it into the hole. I heaved the body up and then broke the box up and hid away the pick and shovel. The trial. The trial took place in Lewis on the 14th of December. Holloway's demeanour throughout was described as aggressive and as having a manner fully in accordance with his atrocious crime. He aggressively challenged witnesses and he blamed Celia's family for driving him to murder her. There were many witnesses all corroborating the account that had been relayed in Holloway's confession. The jury immediately returned a verdict of guilty with a sentence of execution to take place the following Friday, the 16th of December. John Holloway's Execution John Holloway was executed by hanging on the 16th of December, 1831, in Lewis, where he had been born. Holloway's last words before being hung expounded upon the theme of sin and how it had brought him down to his untimely ending. What about Anne Kennett stroke Kennard? If you recall, Anne had been arrested on charges on an accomplice to murder. She was interrogated repeatedly by police, but she insisted on her innocence, despite Holloway's second confession implicating her. Anne was found not guilty during the trial, and the jury found it difficult to conceive that a woman, no less a pregnant woman, could have been capable of such horrific crime. A second arrest was brought up against Anne, this time for concealing and harbouring a known criminal Holloway. Anne, by the time, had given birth and was tried in the dock whilst holding her baby. Anne was acquitted. That concludes this episode of John Holloway's murder and dismemberment of his wife. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and tell your friends. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles. <laughs>